Well, it's good to be together and to uh, share God's Word. Last Sunday, we um, gave the pre-launch message to 40 days of prayer. And uh, many of you, or most of the people that were here, signed the 40 days of prayer commitment. If you weren't here, I'm going to give you an opportunity at the end of the service to make a commitment to embrace this campaign, and I guarantee you will get revived. Something's going to happen, and it's going to be good, because you can't draw close to God, to our Lord Jesus, without blessing, prosperity, uh, insight, increase in your understanding of who God is and his amazing plans and purposes for your life. And so, um, first things first, though, we want to talk about some basic truths about prayer. Now, for some of you, you might think, well, this is kid stuff. Well, I need kid stuff. Yeah. And I decided to preach this because the kids are with us this morning. Yeah, it just shows my age, doesn't it? Just kind of shows, I'm from another generation. These beautiful teenagers that are here with us, eh? Hey. And I want to share on truths about prayer. You know, you are wired for prayer. You're hardwired for prayer. There's hard wire in this facility. If you could see all the wiring here, it's amazing. Huge amounts, so that the electricity can flow. We can have lights, or some lights at least, <laughs> seeing our light system has collapsed, but anyway. Uh, so we can have projectors, so we can have beautiful air conditioning, isn't that great? And, and heating and, uh, and the benefits of it. You're wired for prayer. It's a universal urge. God designed you for himself, and this is why... In this world that we live in, there's a worldwide desire that people have to talk to God. Um, it's part of our spiritual DNA. You can't take it out of you. <laughs> uh, every culture prays to something or someone. They may even pray to a rock. They may pray to a tree. They may pray to the great whatever may be out there. They may not have a correct picture of the loving God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. They may not understand who he is, but there's this innate desire that they want to talk to somebody that they cannot see, that they know deep down is real. And you have this with children who have no religious background at all. They go through intense times of prayer. Intense times of prayer. I remember as a little kid, intense times of prayer that I would be calling out to God and I had no understanding. No one told me the gospel. No one told me to do it. So I'm maybe four or five years of age. I'm pouring out my heart to God. Anyone else like that? Like you just, you just went through those times of intense prayer. Um, even atheists pray when they're in a fix. And um, one of my dear friends who's gone to be with the Lord is uh, Mr. Bruce Rofe. And uh, is Pat here today? No, not here today. But uh, Bruce uh, uh, was a soldier in the Second World War and his story is written up in the official war histories of Australia. I've got a copy of it. And uh, Bruce was a young, early 20s, and he was um, in Papua New Guinea fighting to defend our country. The Japanese Empire was, was endeavouring to cross over to get to Port Moresby and from Port Moresby to come to Australia. And Bruce is early 20s. He gets captured. So these Japanese boys, soldiers, just uh, what possessed them, who knows? Because it's a capital offence to kill a prisoner. So if they were caught after the war, they'd be shot. They'd be executed. So whatever possessed them. So the, they grab Bruce, they want to kill him straight away. So they bring out the sword, great big samurai sword, they want to chop his head off. So the guy swings and Bruce lift his, lifts his hand up and it chops off a finger. It uh, smash. I think it somehow it also smashed into his skull and, uh, 
and then another, another blow just tore the delphoid muscle where he could never use it the rest of his life. Then the guy's trying to stab him and Bruce is going this way and that way and it's just taking too long to kill him. So he pulls the sword away because it's getting messy and bloody and gets out his revolver, clicks it, doesn't work. So they're kind of laughing. These boys are laughing. And, uh, as, as, and, and Bruce there, and he told me this himself. He goes, I just prayed. God, something like, you get me out of this mess and I'll never forget you. <laughs> That's a good prayer. You get me out of this, I'll never forget you. And then and there, he said, this urge came in to start yelling. And he starts yelling and he did say he um, used good Aussie swear words. And... Uh, <laughs> So he's swearing his head off, basically, and, and the Japanese guys are kind of having a laugh because and, and, uh, they know he's going to die. So then he just gets this urge, gets up, staggers up, and he sees the, the jungle there, he goes, okay, and he starts running, but he's smart enough to zigzag because he knew that with the rifles, they would, it's a moving target. So as he's zigzagging into there, just laughing, what's up with this guy? Bang! One bullet straight into, in, in, into his buttocks here. Bang, the second bullet into the ribs, through, and just misses his heart, just by his heart here. Third bullet, forget where it went. So they, they didn't even bother to follow. Now he's dead, he's going to die. Three days later, he staggers to the Australian post. He's, you imagine the wounds. What kept him alive were the maggots that uh, were eating the gang, gangrenous, fleshy stuff. And so even today, in fact, in medical science, there, there is the use of maggots to deal with, with infections that antibiotics can't actually deal with. Can you believe it? He lived. Ends up marrying Pat, who I think sort of nursed him, helped him, took a year of convalescence in the repatriation hospital and decided to go to church every week. But he wasn't a believer. He had not a personal knowledge of Christ. He's attending church like, I won't forget you, God. Where's God at church? So anyway, <laughs> so Billy Graham comes to town, 1959. I mean, I'm only five years of age. Billy comes to town, and, and of course the churches want to provide counsellors so that the Billy Graham campaign had thousands of people come to Christ. So in this church, which I won't name what it is, traditional church, they said, would you like to be counsellors? Mr. and Mrs. Rowe were counsellors. So they're at the campaign, one's at one end of the stadium at Waverley, one's the other. Billy's preaching the gospel. Bruce and Pat said, I don't think we're saved. <laughs> I don't think, we need to come out the front. They're the counsellors supposed to care for those who come out the front. They come out the front and give the, and they meet each other at the front. They both gave their lives to Christ. And um, he became, and Pat still is, most amazing servants of Jesus. And, and I know from my own life what a personal support he has been. And when I was 22 years of age and, and going through a difficult time in the mother church where I was at, our pastor had just died and uh, some of us really were going through a difficult time. We were young guys and uh, Bruce was one of the elders, one of the leaders. And it was a difficult scene after Pastor Harris died and, and I remember going to Bruce and pouring out my heart saying, Bruce, and he actually said, Bill, thank you for coming to see me because I agree with everything you're saying and we're doing we're working hard to do it. And it was a really difficult scene. And, uh, and I remember Bruce looking into my eyes and saying, good on your son for coming to the right. And I said, Bruce, I don't want to talk about this to anyone else. I don't want to be critical. I just want to go to one of my elders. I'm prepared to speak to the whole group. He said, no, no, don't do that. Just to me, that'll be fine. <laughs> and, uh, and it became a bit of a disaster. And when Bruce left and Pat, and they ended up coming to the Christian Family Centre, what an asset they have been. What a personal support they have been of encouragement, beautiful senior people. So here he was, not a believer, crying out to God in the midst of, of hell. It was hell, and God rescued him. So people pray. Miracles happen. We have an eternal soul. Look what Ecclesiastes says. God has planted eternity in the human heart. We have an eternal soul and we just know deep down that there has to be more to this life than just eating, drinking, breathing, getting married, having kids, having a career, and then dying. We're not cats. We're not dogs. We're not 
We're different to the animal kingdom and plant kingdom. It's got to be more, something within us yearns to say, we've got a desire, an insatiable desire for meaning and purpose and significance. And uh, this is what makes us so different to the entire animal kingdom and plant kingdom. I mean, I've had cats all my life. When we're living on the farm with my dad, and one time we had 19 or I think it was maybe 21 cats I counted that were part of our group. 21 cats and we loved them all. Blackie one, blackie two, blackie three, <laughs> ginger one, ginger two, ginger three. I've got two cats now, a beautiful cat, and he goes and finds this stray down the River Torrens. He finds him and brings him back, this scrawny black cat, and now he's a civilised cat, he's a Vasilakis cat, he's kind of... But you know, I've never seen any of my cats on their knees praying. They're instinctively programmed. They just eat, drink, die. They don't think about death. They don't think about the future. That's not their purpose in God. We are made for eternity. We think about death. We think about our future. We're philosophical. That's why people get scarce of living daylights out of them. If you want to ruin a good party, you say, guys, let's get around the table. Let's talk about our death. How would you like to die? When would you like to die? And they'll go, uh, no. well, because we, we think about our thoughts and we think about these concepts. Animals don't. We're made for eternity. That desire within us is to say, there's got to be more to life. Therefore, God is real. You need to connect up with him. So it's a, we're wired uh, for prayer. But also, we all struggle in our praying. Everybody that I know, even people who've been around in the faith who are, I think are fantastically connected to God and I think they're, they're marvellous models for prayer, you ask them and they say, I feel inadequate when it comes to prayer. There are no PhDs in prayer, sorry. There are no professional prayers. Even the great apostle who wrote most of the New Testament, Paul, he struggled to pray adequately. Look what he says in Romans 8, 26. We don't even know what we should pray for, nor how we should pray. There are times where we just don't know what to say. We don't know how to pray. And that's why the baptism in the Holy Spirit with the gift of, of a special prayer language to speak in an unknown language, baptism in the Spirit, if you haven't received it, you need it. You, you young adults, not kids, young people, you need the baptism in the Holy Spirit and the ability to speak in this new prayer language because there are times when I don't know what to pray or how to pray and my prayer is, help me, Jesus. Pray through me. And the Holy Spirit will somehow connect with my own vocal cords as I give him permission and beautiful prayers in a language I've never learnt. It's not Greek, it's not English, it's the heavenly language, the finest words of every angelic language or human language. And, and God has given us that because it, we, we, are all, we all feel inadequate in our praying. We might be too tired or too troubled. But God helps us in our praying. Paul felt this. We are all in the school of prayer. We all need to learn to get better at it. Even the 12 disciples, as they're watching Jesus, they ask him to help them to be able to pray more effectively. In Luke 11, it says, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place and they're all watching him. Watching him, like, they're all goggle eyed. They're listening, they're sneaking in, they're listening as he talks to his father. And, and, and kind of, one of them said, Jesus, Jesus, could you teach us how to pray? That's in Luke 11. You want to put it up, guys? Luke 11, 1. It says, Lord, teach us to pray. Notice they didn't ask him to say, Jesus, teach us how to heal the sick. Jesus teaches how to do miracles. Jesus teaches how to walk on water. Jesus teaches how to feed the 5,000. Jesus teaches how to preach. No, 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 no. They said, teach us how to pray. Because they knew that if they could connect to God like he was connected to God, all these miraculous things would happen naturally because it comes out of a relationship with God. Our frustrations with prayer are usually caused by our misconceptions about prayer. And, and so the following four truths, I'm calling foundational truths, basic truths, and they deal with these misconceptions that we all have. So that I want your prayer life to be the delight of your life, not a duty. 
that so it will be a blessing to you, not a burden. See, God doesn't want you to be driven by guilt to pray, but to be drawn by His grace and His goodness that you say, God, I just want to spend time with you because you are so good and so gracious. I don't have fear or shame or guilt. That only lasts for as long as the shame and guilt and fear lasts. And it doesn't work. So the first thing is Jesus loves it when you talk to him about everything. (laughs) Chosen that word carefully, everything. God is really interested in anything that you are interested in. I'm interested in sport. And I pray some terrible prayers in sport. (laughs) I curse the opposition. I pray blessing upon the person I want to win. Never works. But I think the Lord chuckles with me. Because he loves me and he's interested in what I'm interested in. So I kind of, I, I talk to the Lord while I'm watching my favourite sports people. He knows I don't mean it, but I just, I'm just, I don't say, may he trip over and break a leg. That's bad. <laughs> don't curse your enemies. You've got to bless them. But, you know, he's really interested in anything you're interested in. I love my wife. I love my children. I love my grandchildren. And uh, I love what they're interested in. And, uh, you know, like, uh, one of my grandsons gave me this present the other day. And he brought it in, Papu. I made you this. I'm thinking, what the heck is it? (laughs) (laughs) And I said, thank you, Joey. Thank you. Wonderful. I said, let me give you a kiss and a hug. And I put it on my table. It's up there. I still haven't figured out what it is. (laughs) But I'm really interested in what he's created for me. And when I discover the cue, the, the key to what it is, then I can have a decent conversation with him and say, how did you make that, Josiah? And uh, so that's, God loves you so much that he's actually interested in every dimension of your life. It's not just, oh, 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 I better talk with him before I come to church on a Sunday or before I go to youth meeting. He's interested in every aspect of your life, your study life, learning, your relationships, your friendships, your family your sport, all all those areas of life. He enjoys talking with us. And there is nothing off limits with Jesus. Talk to him about the stuff that's important to you. And some people have this notion that somehow, oh, I can't talk to Jesus about this. Hey, in the early 80s, and, and Kathy and I have shared this several times, when our marriage was, we thought it was finished. There was just such difficulties. I had two beautiful kids. I didn't know what was going to happen. I'd actually planned, okay, I'll resign, I'll go back teaching, I'll hand the church on to somebody else. This is just too hard. And uh, I love her, she loves me, but we can't live together. We're such opposites. It's just such difficulty, such pain, and uh, causing pain to each other. And we didn't even know why we were doing that. And we discovered things later. But I remember crying out to Jesus. I would just I'd tell him everything how I felt. I never used to tell Kath how I felt. That'd be awful. Can't do that. But I'd say, Lord, this is a, I just used to dump on Jesus, like, tell him everything I'm feeling, <laughs> what I'm thinking. And I never felt his condemnation or judgment. I felt his love and acceptance. And he provided a way by which I could get healed in my heart. And Kathy could get healed in her heart. And we'd be drawn back together, and we did, and we proved that love can come back, and we produced two more magnificent children to show you that it spills over into every dimension. <laughs> no more need to be said because we've got kids here. <laughs> God loves you deeply. Even if you can't talk to him or you don't talk to him, But he does want us to grow up. And that means having meaningful conversations with him. As I mentioned last week, if you were here, I know people my age that that, that have grown up, that have grown old, but they're not growing up. I know young people who are in their teens and early 20s and they've grown up. They're mature. They're on the giving end of life. But they're young. I know people three times their age that have grown old, but they've, they've never grown up. And they don't understand 
what it means to become part of the giving end of life. And, and so God wants us to grow up and that means having meaningful conversations with him. Psalm 103 says, the Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. And fear him means respect him, have reverence for him. You know, we love our babies, don't we? Even before they can talk to us. I mean, when Stephanie was born and... Uh, yeah, first, I'm 26, Kath's 24, and, and uh, you know, it was really funny because we had no desire to go out anywhere, even to see our friends. We just wake up in the morning and we just look at her. <laughs> just look at her, like hours, we just look at her. Hey, I produced this. <laughs> Kathy, remind me that I had a little part to play in it. <laughs> I just couldn't believe it. And it was like, I'm awed just by looking at this child. And there's no response back. God is awed just by looking at us. But you know, the day when she spoke, her first words, do you know what her first words were? It just came out, I love you, Daddy. <laughs> well, that's what I thought she said. I said, Kathy, Kathy, she said, my Daddy, dad, 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 dad. And I'm like, oh, that was, the, that was the best. Because now she's talking to me. I've been talking to her for months and months and months and she hasn't been talking back to me. But I didn't stop loving her. But oh, when she started talking, oh, it was just fantastic to see the vocabulary. Oh, it was amazing. God is always tuned in to us. He is always listening in. 1 John 5 says this, John the, the disciple says, we can be confident in approaching God knowing that he listens to us. Whenever we ask anything for, we ask anything, we ask him for anything according to his will. So he listens in, even when we talk with him, when we ask him, but notice what John says, but it's got to be in his will. So sometimes you don't get what you ask for because it's not in his will. It's not good for you. So he's not going to give you something that's not good for you. And so, but he listens. And then, and since we know that he hears us, listens to us, hears us, when we make our request, then we can be sure that he will answer us. Prayer, guys, is a conversation. It's not a ceremony. It doesn't have rules and restrictions and regulations. It's not a monologue where, where we are, you know, we are to talk to him and we are to dial down and tune in and listen to him. He will speak to us. He will guide us. He will answer our prayers. Prayer is a relationship with him. It's not a ritual where I have to pray. If you have to pray, then it's drudgery. It's a privilege to be enjoyed. It's not to be endured. Jeremiah says this, I have good plans for you. This is God speaking. I have good plans for you, not plans to hurt you. I will give you hope and a good future. Then you will call on my name. You will come to me and pray to me and I will listen to you. Wow. Isn't that something? What a wonderful verse. So Jesus loves it when you talk to him about everything. Secondly, Jesus loves it when your prayers are sincere and simple. It has to come from your heart. Real prayers, authentic prayers, honest prayers. Don't use religious cliches. Don't just, don't try to be super spiritual. Jesus doesn't like and he doesn't respond to heartless prayers or to mindless prayers. He just doesn't like them. He wants your heart engaged and he wants your mind to be active. And if you don't believe me on this one, this is what he says just before he gives us the Lord's Prayer. In, in Matthew 6, he says, and when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. These are heartless prayers. And he talks about hypocrites. And what he's referring to, the word hypocrites in Greek has to do with people, see drama, uh, drama was invented by the Greeks. This is true, I'm not bragging, this is true. They invented drama and the two forms of drama that are still around, tragedy and, and humour, comedy. So tragedy and comedy were invented by the Greeks. There was no radio, no TV, very little literature. So what happened was they built stadiums in every town. You can go to every town in Greece and they might have a stadium of, of 100, 200, up to many thousands. 
and they were, they were, they were actors, and they would move around the whole Greek-speaking world, all across present-day Greece, the islands, the Black Sea, modern-day Turkey, and theatre was the way by which you received entertainment, and also where the critics, the political critics, could attack politicians while making fun of them, and the politicians would laugh and not know that these dramatists were poking a stick at them. Nothing's changed. And so, but what would happen is there's so many theatres that, that the acting troops would be like, it might be Philip and Cass and, and Laura, there's three of them, there's, there's, and so they've got about 10 or 15 roles to play. So you can't pay them. So, as they, so Philip's playing one role, and then he comes back, goes quick stage and grabs a mask, and there's another role. So you see this face. And then he comes back and, he, and another mask to play different roles. So what Jesus is saying is, stop playing roles. Stop being a, a drama merchant. Stop being a, a drama queen. Be yourself. Take the mask off. He doesn't want hip hypocritical praying. This is heartless stuff. This is not a dramatic production. This is real. Be yourself. He goes, but when you pray, verse 6, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what he's done in secret will reward you. Do it the other way, you got your reward. What people think of you, what people say about you, here. And then about mindless prayers. He says, and when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans. <laughs> babbling prayers. For they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. See, people who babble in their prayers, they're trying to convince God about something. And it's like, I hear prayer, and I think, are you talking to God or are you trying to convince him? Or you're praying, or are, you, or are you trying to talk to me? Is it, are you talking to me? Talk to me if you're going to talk to me. If you're going to pray, you're talking to God. And I think, who you, what's this prayer about? Are they talking to the Father or are they trying to preach to me? And when I hear that, I don't listen. Ah. You can talk to God, talk to God. If you're going to pray, pray with all, you know, sort of adding extra flowery words doesn't make your prayers more effective. It doesn't. He wants heart prayers. He wants prayers that are thought through. And, and you might, there's no such thing as spontaneous prayer. So if I got, uh, uh, let me say, I've got uh, Nikki. So I say, Nick, uh, in a couple of minutes, Nick, I want you to come and I want you to pray for someone. So you know what you're going to be doing for the next two minutes? rehearsing your prayer. You're going to be thinking about your prayer. He wants me to pray. Oh, what do I pray? He wants me to pray for that. Okay, what do I pray? Oh, Lord Jesus, help me to pray properly. See, what are you doing? You're thinking about your prayers, even if it's a few seconds. No one gets up and just goes, I, I'm just an open conduit. I'm just going to say the first thing that comes to mind. Hey, eh? You might say something stupid. So the Lord wants you to think about your prayers. He wants them to come from your heart, and he wants you to think about them. There's nothing wrong, actually, with even writing out your prayers. If you're journaling and you're using this marvellous manual here, the 40 days, beautiful manual, and, and as you're doing your devotions, you might want to actually write out a prayer because then it's precise. You're not babbling. From your heart, think it through, record it. And see if he won't answer that one. It's well thought through. Hebrews 10.22 says, Let us come near to God with a sincere heart and a sure faith. Talk to Him the way you're really feeling. And you can come with confidence. Many of the Psalms by David and others are prayers or songs of what we call lament. In other words, they're crying. They're upset. They're troubled. They're going through trials. Life is tough. This is a stinker of a situation. This is, life has handed me a curved ball. And, and you, their prayers often are complaints to God about what's going on. And sometimes they even get a bit in God's face, like, but you know, God can take it. He'd sooner you be honest. He's not going to be offended. Well, sometimes David, he's, he's mad as a hatter. Like, he's, he's just... Because that, that king, God, just give it to him in the neck. Rain down fire from heaven and consume them. That's what John said. Well, the Lord's not going to answer that prayer. But at least he got it off his chest. I feel like killing him. 
God, why don't you do him in for me? God just says, no, we'll just hold that one. That's not going to be answered. <laughs> but he's getting it off his chest. And then when you read the rest of it, he finds peace in God by offloading and saying, Lord, I know. I know I'm a miserable sinner. I know I can't. There's not retribution. Lord, help me. Enable me to forgive. Enable me to reach out. Enable me to move on in life. So the Psalms are full of prayers of lament. And it's just saying to us, hey, you've got to get things off your chest. You've got to talk to God and he can handle it. Thirdly, Jesus loves to reveal his goodness by answering your prayers. Okay, he loves to answer prayer. We are encouraged by Jesus to ask our loving heavenly dad for things. Don't be bashful in asking for things. He wants to show you how good he is, how gracious he is, how kind he is by actually answering your prayers. Look at this scripture here. So if, so if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give good gifts to those who ask him? Even hardened criminals... You know, you see some of these guys in prison, I mean, like, you wouldn't want to, tattoos everywhere, hate, vengeance, I'll kill you. You know, like, they put all, like, they've, they've been involved in violent crime, they're in prison for 10, 15 years, and, and so you, you, they're pretty tough guys, you wouldn't want to mess with them. Convicted pedophiles, they don't put them in that prison put them in a separate place. Why? Because those men will kill them. Even the hardened criminals love their kids. You touch my kid, you're dead. That's their, their philosophy. You do something dastardly to my child and you're dead meat. So even the toughest men who are evil, criminals, love their kids. Jesus says, you are sinful when your kid asks for bread you're not going to give him a stone. If he asks for water you're not going to, or drink, you're not going to give him a snake. How much more will your heavenly Father, who is goodness personified, give good gifts to those who ask him? He ain't going to answer all your prayers because some of your prayers are dumb. <laughs> some of your prayers lack wisdom. Some of your prayers are very self-indulgent. And it's like, no, we're not giving you that one. Why? Because he's good. How can a good father give something to a child that asks? Like, like, if, your child, like if, if your child says, Daddy, could you give me a box of matches so I can play with them before I go to sleep and they're six years of age? Oh, of course, child, I will give you that box of matches. And then they burn the house down and kill themselves. Give me a break. No father would do that. As if God's going to give us everything we ask for. Hey, sometimes we don't, our desires are wrong. Sometimes our, our thinking is wrong. Sometimes we just don't know the end from the beginning. God's too good to give you everything you ask for. Unanswered prayer is a mercy. He's gracious. God shows us that he's good. He's a good, good father, even when the answer is no, or if the answer is not yet. <laughs> Jeremiah says this, call to me and I will answer you. I will show you marvelous and wondrous things that you could never figure out on your own. doesn't say I'm going to answer every, every prayer that you ask, but man, you connect with me with sincerity and I'm going to show you stuff that you don't know. I'm going to bless your life. I'm only going to give you good things. Sometimes the answer is a bigger perspective on life. And later on, and how many times I go, oh, now I see... Oh, two years ago, I couldn't see. Oh, Lord, thank you. Thank you for unanswered prayer. You see? Because you trust, because you don't doubt he's good. But if you doubt he's good, you'll be immature your whole life. So if, if you as, as young people do not see God as good, is you'll never grow up. You'll never grow in your understanding. And you might be 55 years of age and you'll be an immature Christian. Because the mature Christian says, God is good. And he will never give me something that's going to hurt me. So therefore, even when the answer is no, 
or not yet, you say, thank you, Lord. I don't doubt your goodness. You are great, you are good. I can't see the end, but he can see the end. So, so maturity, to grow up, to get revived, to get on fire, you've got to get mature on this. This is so basic. But if you don't get the basic truth, you're never going to grow up. You're going to be stunted emotionally. You just see God as this celestial vending machine. Right, money? Ding! Out comes the sugar and the fat and the salt. Is that good for you? No. Nah. I mean, vending machines now, they're trying to have good things in there. But like as if God's going to give you a packet of fat and a packet of sugar and a packet of rubbish or poison. No, 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 he won't do that. If you run a vending machine company, my apologies. <laughs> if we gave our kids everything they asked for, we'd spoil them, we'd ruin them. And so Jesus' delays are not his denials. Mature people grab that. Maturity knows the difference between yes, no, and not yet, because we know him, we're drawn to him, we understand him. Now, I tell you, it can be tested. For me, it was tested. How many times have I said this? My little girl was five years of age and diagnosed with a terrible illness, terrible illness, bleeding internally and in and out of the hospital. We spent half our life in the hospital for many years. Every night, I'd pray, and using my prayer to pray for about a year when I was home, I'd just lay hands on her tummy when she's asleep, praying God to heal her. Uh, sometimes she was so sick, I'd pray, God, give it to me instead of her. I can handle it better than her. Because a parent does that. You take a bullet for your kid. And um, so, but she was getting worse. She was getting worse. The more I'm praying, she's getting worse. It's not improving. People are coming into the church, this is a period of time, it freaked me out. A whole pile of strangers, non-Christians, I didn't know them. They're getting saved and some of them will just get healed just like that. And I'm thinking, God, I don't even know them. And my prayers are working and they're getting healed and touched. My little girl, hey, what's going on? Oh, you should have heard my prayers. <laughs> prayers are lament. But... God came through in his own time, in his own way, miraculously. I couldn't see the end from the beginning. I couldn't see the end of this thing. But gee, I learned to trust him. I, and I, I, I came to a point of understanding how good he is is not based on my circumstances or my feelings or, or I have to have what I want. It taught me to grow up because I was really immature. I, could, I read it in the scripture, but I did, when I'm experiencing the pain and having to go through the pain barrier, I grew up. I understood some things I never understood as a pastor. And I know pastors that have been wrecked by this. I know pastors that have, been, that have quit because of this, because their hearts were so tender and it just didn't seem to be working. Unless you saw the big picture, how good and kind God is. And, and even when he says no or not yet, it's a mercy. And it's tough, it's not, I can tell you, it wasn't easy for me, it was tough, many tears, many tears, many prayers and psalms of lament, I could write my own book of psalms on that one, I'll tell you. Finally, Jesus longs to be close to you, oh, how he wants to be close to you. If you're away from someone that you really love, and you're away for a long time, you just can't wait to catch up. And, uh, you know, I, I go away a lot, and these days it's, it's, I don't like being away for too long, so if it's two weeks, well, I, I just two weeks, I'm missing, I say to Kath, I, I text her, I'm coming back at four o'clock, get them all together. Oh, I'm really tired, Bill. No, no, don't worry about your tiredness, get them all together. <laughs> all the grandkids, I just want to see them. Give them a hug. Get some fish and chips, don't cook, just, just give them some junk food, that's fine. My kids, just to see them. You want to be with them. You long to be with them. God is waiting for you to talk to him. And you know what? He's not too busy for you. It's not like, well, I've got to hang up on this one. Uh, Laura calling. And I'm talking to Phil now, Laura. Sorry, can you wait? No, 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 no. I'm having a special time with James, so you can't talk with him, you guys. Hey, God's lines are open for all of us all the time. He's not too busy for you. 
You just dial in. And you know what the number is? It's not a number, it's a name. It's Jesus. You dial in by saying, I'm in Jesus. Lord, I can come to you anytime because he's my high priest. There's no barrier between heaven and earth now. He's my advocate. He's my mediator. He's my intercessor. Jesus is already praying for you to the Father. The, the, he's never too busy to hear, to tune in. And um, look at this, Isaiah 30. The Lord waits for you to come to him so he can show you his love and compassion. So what's holding you back, guys? Come to him. The more you come to him, 40 days of prayer, the more love and compassion is going to flow in your life. It's going to heal your soul. It's going to fill you with his power to be able to invite people to come along. Hunger for lost souls. Look at Hosea. Look at his passion. Feel the passion of these words. I don't want your sacrifices. I want your love. It's not what you do for me. It's who you are and your connection with me. I don't want your offerings. I want you to know me. That's why we, we take up our tithes and offerings. But if you're giving 10% of your income because you have to, no, 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 no. I'll, I'll just say, don't, don't do it. Don't give it. <laughs> it's not going to profit you. The Lord wants you. He wants you. I want you to know me. I give... Kath and I give 20, 25% of our income away. Ain't a big deal. If I could give 50%, I'd do it. Might get to that point. I can do that. My dad went to be with Jesus and gave me a massive inheritance. I haven't touched it. I haven't touched it. I just feel like it's a gift. What do I do with it? I don't want to spend it on world trips, cars, fans. I just say, Dad, you worked your whole life. I want to use it to help people, to bless people and pass it on to my kids and grandkids but in the meanwhile, so I, I hasn't, haven't changed my lifestyle nor my sisters because we honour our, our mum and dad, wonderful Greek parents but it's been able, to, been able to increase my giving it's not a big deal, just love to do it, I've got the opportunity to give all over the world as well as into my own local church here but I do it because I don't have to do it, I don't and I only talk about it to model it to you, to say, guys, this is a, a way of life. A generous lifestyle flows out of understanding the generosity of God. It's not that I have to, it's that I just love to. And I'm responsible in what I do. I take care of my kids, my grandkids, and other people. I know people that get money and they just buy these clothes and... And, and I just can't believe it. You know, it's like, I literally had a pair of pants, the, like these, and Cass said, you've got to get rid of them, Bill. They're getting thin. I said, oh, no, they're okay. I like them. They feel good. <laughs> well, I'm here at church, and I bend over. <laughs> it literally fell, ah, it, like, it just disintegrated. The whole, it like, wow, it wasn't just split, it disintegrated. And I'm saying, okay, I better go home and change these pants. <laughs> Man, I'd sooner have that than have 300 pairs and I'll never wear them. It's only clothes. I can't take them to heaven with me. Gosh. I don't want your sacrifices. I want your love, he says. I don't want your offerings. I want you to know me. He longs for you. This is one of the most beautiful verses, and I'll, I'll wrap up with this beautiful verse this one I, Jesus said I don't call you servants I call you my friends Ooh. my friends I have friends that are closer to me than than anyone and um, beautiful people wonderful friends and, and to have a friend who is faithful and true no matter what you're going through is a wonderful gift and we have a couple of friends and uh, um, he, he, they're amazing people. We don't live in each other's pockets. We might go out for a meal twice a year. But he was Catherine's first boyfriend. He was 20 and she was 15. Now that's not legal. Not allowed to do that. In that day. But he was 20, she was 15. But in the providence of God, he rescued her out of hell. Kath doesn't know where she would be it wasn't for this beautiful man 
who loved her and ultimately wanted to marry her, but it wasn't possible. And, um, and you know, he could have taken advantage of her because she was so vulnerable, so needy, desperate for a father figure. He never laid a hand on her. Pure, good, wholesome man. And then I came on the scene and I pinched her from him. <laughs> Not quite true. It was a couple of years after they finished up. But then Kathy's best friend, he ended up getting hooked with her. And they're just fantastic. They are the best couple together. So we see each other. And uh, the love and friendship that's there. I mean, he's one of the few men that I allow to kiss me. Greeks do kiss men, you realise that, you know, like, and uh, the other night I had a whole pile of Greeks saying, come and give me a kiss, <laughs> one, two, three, like, but a friendship is something that you know you can rely upon that person, it's something deep, it's, sometimes it's deeper than what you can have with your own sister and brother and even your parents, and Jesus says here, you know what, I want to be your friends. I want to have that relationship with you. I want you to have that relationship with me. And guys, in this 40 days of prayer, that's the kind of relationship that I'm praying that you will have with him and it'll transform your life. Uh, you'll, be a, you'll be a revival machine. You'll be perpet- you don't even try to be spiritual. You'll just be full of God, full of the Holy Spirit, full of his love, the more you're connected with him. And... Um, the closer you get to Jesus, the closer you get to Jesus, the less stressed you'll be and the more blessed you'll become. Seriously. The less stress. I mean, I, I have so many worries and anxieties and issues that I have to face on a day-by-day basis. People just don't, don't get it. They don't know. They don't know my world. Very few people do. The responsibility of a large church like this our group of churches, Christian Family Centre churches, the CRC. I've just met with our CRC executive three days, then we had two days with CFC together. Fantastic. But out of that has come some issues. Okay, yeah, I've got to, I've got to, also I've got to follow through on three or four or five or six things that are pressing. So, okay, that's a burden. That's a need. Oh, that issue's happening. Okay. In Victoria, in, uh, how do you survive? Then you've got your kids and grandkids and and other, you, you've got to have somebody with huge shoulders that can take the burden. And the best one is Jesus. He says, come to me, Matthew 11. Come to you, all you who labor and are burdened, and I will give you rest. And that rest can only come when you trust the person, when you're in intimate fellowship with them. And that's the friendship that Christ provides, no matter what burden you're carrying. You come to Jesus and he will lift that burden. For some of you today that have never given your life to Christ, give him your life. Cast your your guilt on him, your fears, your shame for what you've done in the past or what's been done to you, the stuff that's held you back. There is forgiveness and cleansing and freedom that comes through putting your trust in him who died in your place. And he's alive. And through the Holy Spirit, he comes and... And he comes and walks with us inside, not even alongside, inside. Jesus comes and walks in your life. And he starts the the, the restorative process that takes time. Because sometimes inner healing just takes time. And he so wants to do that. Praise his name. Let me lead you in a prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for our time to share about prayer. And the basics of prayer. Lord, touch people now as we're seated here for any who don't know you as their loving heavenly dad. Father, I pray that they would see Jesus in heaven praying for them now. Jesus who hung on a cross to take their sin. Jesus who rose again. Jesus who sits at your right hand praying for them. And Lord, your Holy Spirit that you've poured out to represent you, to be you, is moving on their hearts. And I pray, help them to believe, help them to cross over that chasm that separates them from you. Help them to see that the cross is the bridge and they can walk safely across from their sinfulness and find forgiveness from their lostness where they can be found. 
where they can become your friends, forgive and save, touch them now. If that's you, while we're, our heads are, are bowed and we're, we're talking to him, if that's you, you've never received Jesus Christ as your saviour and God is speaking to you. Everyone else here is praying for you right now. And you know you need him as your saviour. And everything within you is saying, Bill, I need him. I want him. I'm believing on him now. Let me just see. Just, just no one else looking around. Just lift your hand up. I'll just see it and you can put it down. I'd love to catch up with you afterwards. Is anyone here? Just lift your hand up high. You're saying, yes, Jesus. I want Jesus. I need him in my life. Just lift your hand up wherever you are. And I'll see it and you can put it down again. Yeah, I see your hand. Wonderful. Anyone else? Just join them. I can't quite see with the lights, but lift your hand up high and I'll see it. Yeah, I see your hand. That's good. Someone else? Lift your hand up. Yeah, I see your hand there. That's wonderful. Great. You're responding to Jesus. He loves you. He wants to save you. He wants to be an integral part of your life. Anyone else? Just lift your hand up now. I'm just going to pray for you. And I'd love to catch you afterwards and share with you. Just a couple of moments. Father, thank you for these folks that have lifted their hands and I pray that right now as they're opening their hearts, Jesus, come into their lives as they put their trust in you. They can't see you, but they can feel you. Lord, they know about you, but now they want to know you. Come into their lives as they turn over their hearts, confess their sin and put their trust in you as their saviour. Touch them now. Amen. Amen. Before you leave, you folks, don't, don't go. Just maybe come to the front and, and I'd like to, to shake your hand and just to maybe give you something. I'd like you to see this 40 days of prayer commitment slip. Can we just put it up on the screen? For those of you that weren't here last week, this is between you and God. I, I don't want to see it, but I'd love you to sign it, date it. This is the 3rd of March. And this is the commitment. You might say, oh, commitment, church, Jesus, uh, we're sort of not into that anymore. Commitment's a dirty word today, but I love it. It nails you. You know, it's the difference between living together and getting married. I say to guys, if you love her, marry her. I feel okay about it. If you want to have sex with her, I said, it's a commitment for life. Marry her. I say to her, if he won't marry you and say, I'm committed to you for life, forget him. Move on. Find somebody who will love you and be committed to you for the rest of your life. Don't give him the benefits of the relationship without the commitment that goes behind it. It's true. You can't be married. You can't have kids without commitment. You try and buy a house without commitment. The bank will draw your blood so that you will sign on it. And if you don't pay that monthly mortgage, they're going to take your house off you. Try and get a credit card. Try and join. Commitment's part of life. And we say, oh, but commitment to Jesus. Hey, he is totally good. He'll never let you down for the next 40 days. Make a commitment today if you haven't. And the commitment is this, I fully embrace this transforming journey to learn how to better connect with Jesus, to reach out to experience his power and to receive his blessings in my life. You see, it's not a commitment to me. See, cults get people to make commitments to the cult leader. And you give him your money and you do this and all that stuff. Hey, we're not, forget that, this is Jesus. You're committing yourself to him, not to me, or even to the church, it's to him. I want to grow spiritually, so I make this commitment. I will make it a priority to attend all six weekend services so I won't miss any of the key messages. Don't miss the next six weeks. If you do for some reason, you're sick or something like that, then get hold of the message. We'll put it on YouTube for you. We'll have it on, it's on, you can get it. It's best to be here. But you're only going to get 25% of the benefit of this unless you watch and discuss Pastor Rick Warren's six videos in a life group. And in your life group, we will give you this. Or we'll buy it for 15 bucks. It's worth 35. And I tell you, it's beautiful. It's not just a book. It's beautiful. It's a workbook. You can look back to it and say, it was at the 40 days of prayer when things happened. 
But I got revived and God started answering some amazing prayers. You've got to watch them and discuss them. So it's not just watching 20 minutes of Rick Warren, but then your life group will discuss the questions are down there. And that's why the small groups are fantastic. The smaller the group, the better. If you've got a group with 15, 20 people, it's too many for this. Because you won't be able to talk. I think the, if, if you've got a group of 20 people, divide it up into three. Form three groups. Have a leader. All the leader has to do is press a button. Get the machine going. And the discussion questions are there. Because the more discussion, the better. That you discuss what you see and pray together. So that I will watch and discuss Pastor Rick Warren's six videos in my life group. Or I will help start a small group with my friends over the next 40 days. Hey, what's the smallest group? Two people. Maybe three. You say, I haven't got a home. Well, find a cafe. Get permission. Spend an hour there. Tell the boss you're going to do, you're going to watch something. You know, you maybe put your earphones on so you don't disturb other people. Buy three cups of coffee and two buns or something and, you know, be a good, be a good customer. And just do it weekly. For a couple of girlfriends, I can't get to a small group. Let's form a group. A couple of girls. And then you might bring somebody else in. Hey, you can invite a non-Christian person to come. Because the material's fantastic. So, so that's, I will watch. And then I will make time every day, 15 minutes, I'd say 10 minutes even, to work through the 40 days of devotionals here. Just a scripture reading, a short scripture reading, not even a whole chapter, and a couple of questions. And do that on a daily basis. And then to pray for a dear friend. This is an opportunity. Pray for a friend. And invite them to attend with you to your small group or to a congregational service. Bring them along to the 1030 service. Start praying. This is revival time. God answers prayer. You start praying for people and things start to happen. You might say, oh, but you know, I'm a bit too scared. So... Turn your fears into faith. Trust Him. The worst persecution you'll get is they might say no. Wow, that's really hard. Invite them. Someone that you love, someone that loves you, you're connected with. Share the gospel. Go and tell them. Invite them to come and see. What an opportunity, but pray for them. I will pray for a dear friend. Ushers, could you please give these out straight away to everyone? Quickly, run down the aisles. Just give them. Don't hold back. Lift your hands up if you haven't received them. We need more people to help them. It's going to take us 10 minutes to do. Pastor Phil, just help them. Lift your hand up if you weren't here last week and you didn't have one. Lift your hand up high so they see them. Give them out. Throw them out. Catch them. All these beautiful young people here. I said it the right way. Grab one of these. Even my grandchildren, grab them. Okay, that's it. Grandpa's giving it to you. Everyone who hasn't had one. You need a pencil? Need a pen? They will give you a pen. Guys, this is between, and I want you to stick it in your Bible, hang it up on your wall, tick every box, sign it, and put the date on it. 3rd of March 2019. Commitments are important. 19th of August 1978. I said, I do, I will to my wife. I made that vow before God, I made that vow before her, and I've kept it. Make a commitment to Him, and you see what, what He will do. Now, as you do that, this is between you and God. We have now 38 life groups that are developing in the life of the church. That's grown from around 13, 14 to now just under 40. In fact, after today, there may be 40. Pastor Cass, come and share with us about the life groups because we're going to pray for the life group leaders.